You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 31st, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atopic dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Luce Finasier. She's a professor of medicine and is also the president-elect of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at New York University Winthrop Hospital in Mineola, New York. We're going to talk about atopic dermatitis, and um, I have changed it a little bit because I think there are a lot of updates on atopic dermatitis uh, now that I think we uh, can uh, make a lot of use of. So uh, we are going to identify patients. The very basic of atopic dermatitis is first is you have a patient walk in with an eczema. What you want to do is to confirm your diagnosis that this is indeed atopic dermatitis. And then if it is atopic dermatitis, you want to determine the severity of your atopic dermatitis so you can decide what sort of treatment uh, you will offer the patient. You discuss current standard of care, which is for all types of severities of atopic dermatitis. And then we will discuss new and emerging treatment for atopic dermatitis. So let's talk about the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. Um, there are many uh, uh, theories on why atopic dermatitis occurs in a patient, and actually there are many abnormalities in atopic dermatitis, and all of them are equally important. The first one uh, is uh, immunologic abnormalities, and they're both cellular and humoral immune responses that are important. And in the cellular immune response, you have the Th2, Th22 deviated immune reactions. And you have Th2 cytokines that are released, which includes IL-4 and IL-13, which will then stimulate your B cells to produce IgE. And of course, your humoral responses, we know that there is an increase of IgE to allergens. Along with that, we have barrier dysfunction. There are innate barrier dysfunction. This includes the filaggrin uh, mutation. And the immunologic, like IL-22, actually suppresses uh, uh, a barrier uh, protein as well. Then we have the genetics. Uh, this is only two of the important genetics that we have found to affect atopic dermatitis here, your filaggrin mutation and your Sphinx-5. And obviously, a lot of non-immunologic mechanisms, include, including the itch-scratch cycle, which includes anxiety and stress, irritants that, such as uh, detergent, solvents, wool, and perspiration, uh, environmental factors, uh, temperature and humidity. Then you have your infections, colonization. It's not only staph, there are other infections that are important, which we will discuss later on. So looking at the, uh, the immunologic defects, you, as I said, there's a barrier defect. You have the flagrin, you have the itch scratch cycle. Because of these barrier defects, irritants, allergens, and infections can get into the epidermis uh, more uh, frequently uh, and more easily. And uh, they interface with the Langerhans cells and the dendritic cells and the immune activation, particularly of your Th2 pathways and a Th2 signaling pathway as well. So these Th2 cytokines, such as your IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5, lead to one IgE switching here by your B, uh, by your plasma cells, by your B cells, and it induces peripheral eosinophils and mast cells. So now you have your very important cells that are participating in the immune response. Th2 and Th22 cytokines also contribute to the impaired expression of barrier proteins and barrier impairment. So let's look at this kid who comes to your office, really miserable. Uh, is what is uh, the, your diagnosis. You have to confirm that this is indeed atopic dermatitis. And what are the criteria for atopic dermatitis? Let's look at the essential criteria. It has to be present. If it's not present, it's not atopic dermatitis. So it has to be itchy or it's not atopic dermatitis. You have to have the eczema. It could be acute. It could be 
subacute or it could be chronic. Uh, there are certain morphologic features such as age-specific patterns. Infants and children tend to have it in the face, neck, and extensor areas. And other age groups, the older they are, you can have them in the flexural regions. For most of this, this the groin and the axilla are spared, and if, especially if you have an axillary eczematous dermatitis, think of contact dermatitis rather than atopic derm. And it has to be chronic and relapsing. If a 70-year-old comes to your office, first time onset of eczema, no history of atopy, it's unlikely atopic derm. Supportive, uh, and we are, as allergies, very good in getting this history, is a history of A to P. Could be a personal or a family history of A to P. Your patients can have total elevated IgE or specific IgE, especially the dust mites. They can have the positive skin testing, and their skin is dry, or what we call cirrhosis. And associated criteria are very nonspecific. You can have facial pallor, white dermographism. You can have the keratosis pilaris, pityriasis alba, hyperlinear palms, um, ichthyosis are almost like fish scales, ocular and periorbital changes. Uh, again, uh, periauricular lesions, especially in new moms who start to breastfeed, uh, this can uh, come up, uh, and perifollicular or around the hair follicle accentuation. A lot of time we see patients already with the chronic eczematous dermatitis secondary to trauma, which is your lichen simplex chronicus. So uh, I spoke about the distribution, and I wanted to kind of show you what to look for, especially in infants. In infants, the facial, the forehead, the cheeks, and the chin are very commonly involved, and then also some of your extensor areas. But generally, their diaper area is spared. The younger child will still have the face, uh, but then you know, you have you start to have more of the antecubital and your uh, posterior popliteal fossa. In the adult and the adolescent, you will see that the, uh, the hands and the feet are uh, be become very common occurrence. Darker skin um, evaluation is always difficult for uh, uh, atopic dermatitis and even for urticaria. It's hard to see the redness, it's hard to see the erythema. And so these are examples where you can, you can see how difficult it is. Uh, you can have follicular accentuation, which could be more prominent. In this hand um, has a pronounced hypopigmentation, and you have this grayish, uh, white, whitish, ashy skin discoloration. Uh, that is a feature of atopic dermatitis in dry skin. So just something to consider. You have to exclude other diagnoses, and I will just show you some that do look like atopic dermatitis, and uh, you have to make sure that this is not what you're dealing with. So scabies could be very generalized. It definitely is very itchy. The itch is worse at night, and sometimes you don't see those classic burrows, and all you see are excoriations like this person. Seborrheic dermatitis tend to... Uh, uh, occur in the seborrheic area, so the phase, uh, you can have in the glabellar area here, uh, an, and then prominent nasolabial fold, they have to tend to have this yellowish, greasy discoloration, uh, and uh, they in the scalp, they may complain of some seborrhea or dandruff. Contact dermatitis could be irritant Ooh. or allergic. This is classic ichthyosis, looking like fish scales. This is because of dryness of the skin. And of course, you can have this, which does look like atopic dermatitis, but this is actually a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And you can have uh, some immune deficiencies, and this is a patient with a migratory polycyclic erythema uh, associated with immune deficiency. We shall discuss that later. And erythema or generalized redness and exfoliation or erythroderma of all other causes. So 
looking at this six-year-old girl, she has a very paretic eczematous dermatitis. So you can see her face. You can see around her mouth. Uh, she had the, the uh, in, in her back. She had diarrhea, failure to thrive up to one year of age. She does have peanut allergy. Both patients, both parents have atopic dermatitis. You can see her, her hair is fine and thin. And you can see also some thin thinning in, in the arms. There's eczematous lesions, but there's also a lot of erythema and thinning. Uh, so you pull out a, one of the hairs, and uh, sometimes uh, the eyelash may be a good area to pull rather than the scalp. And what you saw under the microscope is this uh, bamboo hair. And this is actually netherton. It is rare, it's autosomal recessive, but you have this erythroderma, which I showed you earlier, or diffuse redness of the skin. You have that bamboo hair here. You can have uh, your ichthyosis linearis and complexa, which is this uh, polycyclic redness that I was talking to you about. She does have atopic diathesis. She uh, is atopic, uh, peanut allergic and she had failure to thrive. There are some other immunologic abnormalities associated with netherterns. You can have transient neutrophil function defects. You can have impaired cellular immune responses and you can have elevated complement levels. So let's move on to an adult. Uh, she's 61. She's a patient who came in our office uh, with a five-year duration of peritic eczema, which means the onset of her eczema is about 56 years of age. She did not have any family history of atp. She has since discontinued her only medication for hypertension as per her PMD. She has had a trial of different types of topical corticosteroids, and it did not help. So this is the, 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 the what, what I was pointing to you about. Is she, she doesn't have an atopic history, and the onset is late onset. So we did a skin biopsy, and it turned out to be cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, or what we would call mycosis fungoides. This is probably the most important differential diagnosis of atopic dermatitis in adults that our fellows need to watch out for. They come in different stages. So the patch stage is what I showed you. Here you will see that it, she has some atrophy. She has some wrinkling in the skin. Uh, there is some reticulated, you see these blood vessels that are rather fine. That's called reticulated pigmentation. The pruritus can be present, but it's usually minimal, and it's common in the premycotic phase and may even precede the rash, uh, and it's often on the lower trunk and buttocks. There are other uh, stages where you have the plaque stage, which I showed you earlier, and you can have the, uh, the tumor stage. Uh, the patch and the plaque stage will probably end up in the allergies office because it does look like atopic dermatitis and they could be itchy as well. Uh, diagnosis has to be made by skin biopsy. So once you firm with your diagnosis or it's most likely atopic dermatitis, you want to determine the disease severity. The literature review has so many uh, uh, ways of determining disease severity. There are different severity scoring measures, and 62 of them published. There are 28 quality of life tools, but there's really three, only three that are validated. That's the score right, which is scoring atopic dermatitis. There's the eczema uh, area and severity index, which is the easy score, and there's the patient-oriented eczema measure, or the POEM. And I wanted to just compare this uh, and and uh, as you're reading papers on how to evaluate uh, atopic dermatitis or research on atopic dermatitis, realize that the score is probably the most comprehensive. It includes the physician assessment of the symptoms, how the skin looks. It includes the extent of the lesion, the, the uh, body surface area. And this is measured by the rule of nines. The rule of nines is what we use for burns. It includes the patient assess symptoms, which includes itching, pruritus, or uh, insomnia. The easy score is acceptable. 
uh, and it includes physician assessment um, of the symptoms. It includes the extent of the, the, the lesions, but this is calculated from uh, a, a different uh, 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 cal uh, form, and I will show you how. It does not include the patient assessed symptoms, so quality of life is not included in easy. As you go down to the easier ways of uh, evaluating the patient, which is the IGA, Global uh, Investigators Global Assessment, you get less and less, of course, and uh, it, you have the physician assess symptoms, but you don't measure the extent of lesions and you don't uh, uh, include the patient assessed uh, quality of life. So there are different categories from mild, moderate, severe, depending on your scoring. Looking at this, obviously, IGA, Investigator Global Assessment, is the easiest to perform. Uh, almost clear, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. So we went through extent of lesion, more than 10% BSA is considered um, uh, severe severity of lesions, excoriations like identification and infections make it more severe. Uh, burden uh, quality of life, uh, most important to look at pruritus and sleep, emotional and mental health, and interference with daily activities. But when you have areas that are visible, such as the face or the hands that are very important for function, this raises up the severity of atopic dermatitis. They could be moderate to severe because even if they don't have enough of the extent of lesion or the severity of lesions, but they are in very important functional areas. So how do you like, measure extent of disease? As I said, SCORAD, which is the rule of nines uh, that we use in burn, how to estimate that is that the palm of your hand, whether it's Paul's or Jake's or mine, uh, is about 5% of body surface area. And if you include all the fingers, each of these palmar surface uh, estimates about 1% of body surface area. So that's, that, that's kind of going to help you in, okay, what is the 9% here in, in, in this adult? The easy score, as I said, is uh, scoring it assigned certain numbers, and it's a little bit more tedious. Okay, trying to advance. Okay, so uh, spoke about IgA, which I said is the easiest. It's not validated in the practice setting. It is static. It's when you see the patient when they come to your office. Although you can give them a time frame and say in the average of uh, a week, uh, what, what do you think? So you have your clear here. You have your almost clear, a little bit of redness. Uh, there, you When you palpate it, it might be a little rough. And then you have your mild, which you definitely can feel. Then your moderate is more extensive, and then your severe. I said it does not evaluate symptoms, only signs. It does not include body surface area, but it is simple. And the FDA actually accepts this kind of assessment for studies on atopic dermatitis. So what do, um, and pruritus or uh, symptom burden and quality of life is the third a uh, factor that is very important in assessment of atopic dermatitis. So I, there's a pruritus numerical rating scale where I tell the patient, scale of 1 to 10, 0 is you're not itching, 10 is your worst in that imaginable, 8 wakes you up, 6 distracts you from activity, where are you? And you can give this question in one minute and they can give you an answer. So, is there a practical objective tool for identifying moderate to severe atopic dermatitis? So, this is what I use personally. This is what our fellows use. The simplest is percent body surface area, and you don't need to be specific like it's 22%. You, you can just say it's, less, it's more than 10% or less than 10%. Uh, your IgA score, which is 1 to 4, 0, mild, moderate, or severe, and your pruritus score, which is 1 to 10, uh, and moderate to severe, uh, topic, moderate is if you have a 5 to 10% body surface area with an IgA score of, of 3, and severe is more than 10% with an IgA score of 
uh, for. So uh, regardless though, as I said, of body surface area, if it's involving uh, visible areas, important function, uh, you will consider them, you can consider them as uh, uh, moderate to severe, especially if there's a significant impairment of quality of life. So this is uh, what uh, we published in 2018 in the annals. Uh, we had uh, atopic dermatitis yardstick and had practical uh, recommendations. Know that all guidelines, regardless of whether they're from the American Academy of Dermatology or the European uh, Academy of Dermatology, uses a step-up system uh, depending on the disease severity. And uh, I'm going to talk about the first part of it, which is the basic management of atopic dermatitis. All of the patients need to have the skin care and trigger avoidance. So what are the triggers for atopic dermatitis? Infections, contact uh, allergy, food and aero allergens. For infections, they include bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. The most common bacterial super infections you will see here in impetigenized uh, rash uh, with your yellowish, oozy, crusty lesion is actually staph aureus. Uh, you have eczema herpeticum, which can, you, you have this ulceration that could be painful. It could be extensive. You have your fungal infection. You have the dermatophytic infection, uh, such as here, uh, tinea pedis. But you have a specific malazitia simpondalis uh, lesion. Uh, it's, um, it is easier to detect in a dark-skinned atopic. Uh, but it may be masked in a fair skin. But what you see are these light colored uh, 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 plaques actually because they're almost flat and you will see some fine scales on top of that. And this is uh, Malassezia simpondalis. IgE antibody against Malassezia simpondalis has been shown in patients with atopic dermatitis and treatment of the Malassezia simpondalis actually improved atopic dermatitis. So uh, that's something to watch out for. It's more common in the face uh, and the neck. Contact allergy could be irritant or allergic. Uh, food we can test, but it's not very common. Of the aero allergens, the smites and pets are probably uh, tr uh, important triggers. Once you've identified triggers and you've uh, instructed the patients on how to avoid them, you are ready to treat. There are general supportive care. There is getting the disease under control and there is keeping the disease under control. So hydration, emollients, baths, and wet wraps we will discuss. Uh, getting the disease under control involves the use of anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, the strength of this medication will be based on your disease severity, uh, and you can use stronger steroids for short bursts. And keeping it under control by steroid sparing agents, uh, immunodevices, and proactive treatment. So let's look at bathing. As I said, hydration and emollients are key to the uh, uh, a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. They have a basic uh, a barrier defect. So uh, what we tell our patients, so soak for 10 to 20 minutes. Oatmeal doesn't make a huge difference. It's the soaking that's important. Use mild soaps and cleansers, pat dry, and make it fun for, especially for the kids. They have to not fear uh, getting wet because if it's not fun, they will really not allow you to soak them for 10 to 20 minutes. Immediately after hydration or bathing, I just say drip dry or pad dry, apply your occlusive emollient or topical medication. You can use your Vaseline, you can use your Cetaphil or CeraVe or Vani Cream or Vani Ply. Uh, this improves uh, skin barrier function. It reduces susceptibility to irritants and it strengthens the skin by delaying intercellular filaglin uncoiling. What medications are available topically? You have these three groups, steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, and PDE4 inhibitors. Your topical corticosteroids are first line. 
Usually before you can even go to talk about uh, calcineurium inhibitors, some insurance will require you to fail topical corticosteroids. Our problem with that is skin atrophy and thinning, uh, and there's really no consensus regarding optimal dosing or frequency. We have two uh, calcineurium inhibitors, tacrolimus uh, and pimacrolimus. Uh, tacrolimus is an ointment, pimacrolimus is a cream. Uh, both are now available generic. Uh, still expensive though, they are non steroidals they will inhibit calcineurin-dependent T-cell activation. You can use it in the areas that are prone to atrophy, such as the face or the uh, fl uh, flexural areas. It may, it, however, there is a block, burning, block box warning here that was never removed, despite little evidence, and I'll discuss that in a little while. PDE4 is a is crisaborol. It is not steroidal approved four years ago. Um, well, data is about four years, as, uh, if we call that long term. Uh, uh, so as I said, although any of these classes can be used concomitantly, initially, many insurance companies will require a stepwise treatment, and uh, may, you may just need to to show that your steroids. Um, as I said, have uh, tenuous local side effects, and I, I just want the fellows to uh, be aware of what they're looking at. This is a stria uh, that you see. There's also prominent injectation in the skin from chronic steroids here. You have your atrophy. Uh, it's almost like a stretch mark that uh, w women have uh, during pregnancy. Uh, here you see your telangiectasia, your uh, uh, blood vessels are prominent and there's redness here. At this stage, actually, if you stop your topical corticosteroids, you can probably still reverse the telangiectasia. Uh, this pigmentation, this is a patient of ours um, uh, with really severe atopic dermatitis, currently on the polymab, much better, but the post-inflammatory hypopigmentation remain uh, uh, to date. Uh, Side effects that are systemic, uh, we are aware of, uh, although this is topical corticosteroids, the side effects of adrenal suppression is more important in infants and small children. We haven't seen much in adults of the systemic uh, side effects, but we have seen a lot of local uh, side effects for uh, both adults and children. I spoke about topical carcinoma inhibitors for eyelid, perioral, genital, axillary, inguinal areas. Um, the potency, just for comparison, so 0.1% uh, tacrolimus uh, is the same as an intermediate strength corticosteroid. So uh, let's put this in perspective. Uh, that's a uh, triamcinolone. Uh, th this is protopic 0.1%. Uh, it's about the same as uh, triamcinolone. And these are more potent than 1% uh, pimacrolimus or elidel. Proactive treatment has been shown to be safe and effective for up to one year in reducing flares. And uh, we'll discuss that in a little while. So limitations of topical carcinoma inhibitors. I spoke about theoretical risk of a viral infection. Uh, there is... Uh, there is indeed skin burning and even pruritus that then that can occur when you first apply it, especially if you if it's applied in acute inflamed skin. So to get around this, I would ask them to use a topical corticosteroid for three days, calm the skin down, and then apply your um, topical carcinoma inhibitors. The black box warning of carcinogenicity stays in the label, and they, because it's generic, there will not be any studies that will try to disprove it. However, I just wanted to show you our, uh, and we published this, there's a case control, uh, we reviewed it and published a review, case control study of almost 300,000 patients treated with atopic, uh, with, tri, uh, with uh, tacrolimus, uh, in atopic dermatitis and did not find any increased risk of lymphoma. And the paper noted that actually the very severe atopic dermatitis patients have an increased risk of, of lymphoma compared to those with no atopic dermatitis, regard, with, even without consideration of treatment with topical carcinoma inhibitors. Uh, subsequently, a peer study of 26,000 person years of 7,000 children 
treated with pimecrolimus reported five malignancies with incidence rates comparable to the SEER general population data. So, Chris Averill, uh has, uh, I, I, I think uh, this is a uh, Eucrisa. Uh, efficacy has been established as early as day eight of treatment. Uh, reduction in atopic dermatitis signs and symptoms. There, the two interesting things with Crisabra, one is it's approved for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. So you still have the severe atopic dermatitis that, that that's a problem. And uh, that PD4 actually uh, directly regulates pruritus through the reduction of cutaneous neuron and dorsal root ganglion neuron activity. So, uh, so for those that are very itchy, I, I think this is something that uh, patients uh, uh, will benefit from. It does have a favorable safety profile. It does not have your black box warning. I, I topic dermatitis flares every now and then, and uh, acute crisis intervention includes bleach baths and uh, wet wraps and uh, quickly on bleach bath again 10 to 20 minutes uh, uh, it's it's just a cup of uh, uh, one fourth cup to one half cup of of bleach in your uh, tub full of water uh, have the patient soak uh, twice uh, daily and uh, have the patient soak uh, initially uh, what I would do is regularly for three days and then twice a week. After the bleach bath, have them soap and uh, rinse and apply your topical therapy. Uh, topical therapy is applied twice daily. Uh, you can use at least a mid-potency topical corticosteroid on wet skin. Uh, the amount of ointment in an adult step is about uh, uh, about uh, a palm uh, size, two palm size of area that it can be applied on. And why I brought this up is I wanted to give you an idea that under treatment or under prescription of the topical corticosteroids is also a problem. You give them 15 grams of, the 15 gram tube is not going to last them two or three days, especially if you have a body surface area over 10%. Emollient is applied on top of your topical anti-inflammatory agent. Wet wraps are not that simple, but it certainly uh, does work. And this is what they do in a national Jewish. Uh, what you do, obviously, is after you put the topical area, you put in a wet uh, 1C if you have a kid. Uh, and on top of the wet 1C is a dry one. And, um, you, uh, and they sleep with that. Uh, almost impossible to do this with adults, but I have had success on making um, adults do this by just doing areas. So I would have them do both arms first or both legs and cycle it. Once you have it under control, then you can just put the topical cortical starch without the wrap. And the critical evidence show that it is efficacious as a short-term treatment. It's never meant for a long-term treatment. You can use diluted corticosteroids. It's more effective than emollient alone. Again, uh, uh, up to 14 days, it's been shown to be safe in children. Uh, and uh, you will have to lower the uh, absolute amount of topical starch to once daily and further use the, the low potency one to, to reduce the risk of systemic uh, dia availability. So you've done this, you know your diagnosis is atopic dermatitis, you checked, uh, you did the smite control, you, there's no more infection, patient's not allergic to food, uh, uh, you did, and, and mom, mom says that, yeah, this kid's actually uh, doing all of this that you said, and of course, psychosocial issues, you still have a patient who's as miserable as what you had earlier. Uh, this is the definition of treatment failure. But there's no standard definition of treatment failure. What what will you consider as a treatment failure? One is uh, inadequate clinical improvement in spite of all your treatment. There's no relief of impairment. You're still itching, still quality of life is poor, still not going to school. There's a lack of stable long-term control. It just flares frequently. Every other week it's flaring. Or you start to see the side effects that I showed you earlier. 
that's treatment failure. But what, then there's another question is, what is the time to treatment failure? Again, there's no generalizable time to demonstrate. Uh, okay, when can you, can I say that the topical corticosteroids or, uh, or the uh, topical carcinoma inhibitors, how long should I put it on and say it's not working? Uh, given the range and potency, uh, probably up to four weeks if you've used it up to four weeks of af active treatment or you've after you've controlled it two to three times a week of sites prone to recurrence to prevent it but it's still flaring that's probably a time frame that is uh, uh, reasonable to use again in selected patients and specific body sites you may need more than four weeks uh, but in other selective patients you may need less than four weeks uh, as well so uh, what are your choices? Well, newer therapies are out there and I um, wanted to define for you what's the difference between biologics and small molecules. So biologic agents is anything that's produced from living organisms. Uh, vaccines are biologics. They're larger in size. They're typically given as an injectable or a parenteral. Uh, and uh, by the mechanisms by which they will interfere with pathologic pathways include being a soluble receptors, uh, antibodies against cytokines or cytokine receptors. Small molecules actually are compounds manufactured through chemical synthesis. Your aspirin is a small molecule. It's smaller in size and it can be given orally. So looking again at the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis that i showed you earlier i wanted to now show you the targets of the different uh, uh, biologics and small molecules that are uh, up and coming one one that is approved is the pilumab as you can see here is an anti-il4 anti-il13 medication so uh, il4 and il13 are th2 cytokines and uh, our media, they mediate a lot of features of uh, atopic dermatitis. It is fully human. It's against the IL-4 receptor alpha here that you see. And IL-4 receptor alpha is part of IL-4 and IL-13. And that's why it targets both. Uh, it blocks this, obviously, the signaling through the jack stack pathway. Uh, and uh, what happens is, uh, is that it blocks the, effect, the bad effects of atopic dermatitis. So in atopic dermatitis, there's an increased signaling by 4, 4 and 13 associated with the disease process. And what does increased signaling of IL-4 and IL-13 do? They amplify the signaling of TH2 cytokines. They increase inflammatory cells. They increase sensitivity to allergens. They you have an inappropriate uh, IgE class switching. These all results in a weakened epidermal barrier. You have a decreased antimicrobial protein, decreased keratinocyte differentiation, and a decreased epidermal lipid. So uh, the study on the pilumab is, uh, I just gave you the summary. You will see here for the easy score, the change in baseline. Uh, what I wanted to show is that within so dupilumab is given every two weeks, right? You have a loading dose, uh, day zero, and then uh, every two weeks is, uh, is, uh, is three, 200 or 300 milligrams. Uh, as you will see, even after the first or second dose, there is already a marked improvement. There is already improvement in, uh, in your easy score. But uh, interestingly, when patients come back to us, and I usually want to see them, after uh, two months, after the first shot, is it's really the, uh, the improvement of pruritus that uh, uh, that they talk about. The pruritus improved in one or two shots, and uh, that uh, you know they come in and say I can sleep for the first time at night. Uh, the adverse reaction is injection site reaction and ocular symptoms, um, including just dry eye to conjunctivitis to pruritus. Uh, this, unfortunately, when they did the research, they just lumped them all together. Uh, there was no ophthalm. This is a uh, investigator reported, and there was no ophthalmologic uh, input in this uh, side effect profile. 
Uh, aside from the Pilima, what else do we know people give for uh, atopic dermatitis? Well, steroids. Um, uh, we have uh, patients are already uh, sent to us with Cushingoid and uh, because they've been on systemic uh, corticosteroids. Uh, we we know the risk of this. I'm not going to go over that in interest of time. But if we should give it, it should be uh, short term uh, because of rebound. You know, your skin will get worse after you discontinue treatment. And uh, you want to reserve this for uh, crisis management. You need at that point to have a strategy for long term. Uh, maintenance, you have to uh, have to have a strategy on how to taper the steroid and a strategy to intensify the skin care. Phototherapy or ultraviolet ther therapy, it actually is approved for atopic dermatitis. Uh, it has been shown to be effective and safe even in children. So narrowband UVB. The problem is that you will need to, uh, the patient has to go to the doctor's office about three times a week to receive this. Uh, and the safety monitoring, including sunburn, erythema, and the carcinogenicity of UV therapy for skin cancers. These are uh, systemic therapies that are available. They have been used uh, as second line before the pilimab. Uh, they are immunosuppressants and they will all need um, monitoring and um, they will uh, they all have their box uh, boxed warning so what did I go over I talked about uh, mild uh, to moderate atopic dermatitis and if they fail what can you do well you can increase your topical steroids add DCIs or add crisoborol and then as I said four weeks is probably a good time to reevaluate and you define your inadequate response. I like to point out that even if you don't have an absolute um, response, uh, for some patients, minimally clinically important difference, uh, uh, such as an easy score of 6.6 .6 points improvement, is, uh, is enough for them. Because they can sleep and um, uh, even if they still have some uh, rash. Then we step up to moderate to severe. We talked about biologic therapy, phototherapy, and systemic immunosuppressants. I talked about uh, the flares uh, uh, for um, atopic dermatitis. It, uh, it's anywhere from healthy to chronic looking. And uh, same patient can have all the different stages. There is proactive treatment to try to prevent the flare and there are two medications that have been shown to work proactively, meaning if you apply, once you get the disease under control and you have the patient apply for two successive evenings every week, so I would tell them over the weekend you would have a weekend treatment on the areas that tend to flare. On Saturday and Sunday you apply methylprednisolone 0.1%. And it's been shown uh, in a study that uh, it's 3.5 times less likely to, fare, to flare compared to just putting emollient alone. Similar findings with the crolimus if you want, um, especially in the flexural areas uh, for, because they don't have the atrophy side effect. Prevention uh, for uh, a possibility of stopping the atopic march. Uh, but I would like to discuss emollient therapy from birth. This is a randomized trial. Uh, full body emollient therapy once a day starting at three weeks of age. As against those who are no emollient therapy. Uh, and there was a relative risk reduction of 50%. So it is a feasible, safe, and effective approach. And really, if it, this is confirmed in large trials, it would be simple it be the low cost that can reduce the global burden of allergic disease. There are some studies that are less controlled, um, two or three that I saw that says that this has no effect, but again, um, the, uh, some were not controlled and some were mild to moderate rather than um, uh, uh, risk rather than high risk. 
There are emerging targeted systemic therapies that I talked about, the biologic, one of them was the uh, dupilumab. Uh, IL-13 is probably, th uh, which is th uh, tralokinumab and lebrikizumab, uh, is probably uh, ongoing phase three, similar efficacy, uh, but uh, the JAK ones are also in phase three, and I wanted to discuss the JAK inhibitors. Uh, what is JAK? JAK is uh, JAK stat is JAK signal transducer activator of transcription. Uh, it is an intracellular signaling pathway uh, on which many pro-inflammatory cytokines elicit their pathophysiologic uh, function. So. Uh, here we will see where JAK works when, when you have your cytokine, JAK will then regulate, uh, JAK start regulates the transcription of, of uh, inflammatory uh, cytokines. JAK pairing in different cytokines, the therapeutic profile of individual JAK inhibitors depends on multiple factors, the potency, the selectivity, uh, the intracellular uh, concentration. Note that no JAK inhibitor is specific for only one JAK isoform. So in atopic dermatitis, I just picked and chose for you the, the, the ones that are important for atopic dermatitis. And you can see in the pathophysiology, these are IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, TSLP, and IL-22. There are oral JAKs out there, and but interestingly, are topical JAK inhibitors. So we did talk about uh, a little bit about genetics. We talked about the environmental. We talked about the immune a lot more. But they, I would like to talk about a microbiome. So the cutaneous microbiome uh, is, uh, is, is important because we know that atopic dermatitis uh, flares with increase of staph aureus. It also flares with the reduction in microbial diversity. With increase of uh, staph aureus, there's exotoxins that are produced. The epidermal barrier uh, function gets worse because of the protease and lipase that is produced by the staph. And this is probably the mechanism by which the bleach bath is thought to decrease the severity of atopic dermatitis because there is a reduction of staph aureus in areas that were soaked with bleach. Um, Again, emphasizing it's not just the stuff aureus, though, that is a focus of potential therapy. Um, and it's not only a reduction of stuff aureus, but also reduction of microbial diversity. And therapy with commensal bacteria is the basis for fecal transplant in C. difficile and probably the basis of our hygiene hypothesis. So this is just one of the, the things that are coming up now, spraying Rushumonas mucosa in atopic dermatitis skin. There is uh, uh, your vitrocilla piliformis, staph epidermidis, and staph hominis. Uh, and uh, there's a microbe trans uh, coagulase negative staph in moderate severe atopic. This is a study. This is a report of, I can't remember how many patients. This is pre-application of Rushumonas mucosa. Uh, on atopic dermatitis skin, and you can see how nicely it cleared on week 10, and this was also used in the face and around the mouth. So there are emo uh, emerging new therapies, which will revolutionize our atopic dermatitis uh, care, but the extent of their effect on patient care will depend on affordability and accessibility of patients. The, the broad range of socioeconomic group, different insurance, we know that it's not, uh, these drugs are just extremely expensive and um, we, may, we may have to combine treatment for these patients. So my last slide is, um, uh, second to the last, uh, is, uh, is again our uh, uh, atopic dermatitis yardstick where we step up from uh, mild to moderate atopic dermatitis assessment moderate to severe, definition of failure, and our options of treatment. Uh, we'd like to convert all our patients with uh, this skin to this skin. And that's, uh, yeah, any questions? Oh, I made it to one o'clock. Thank you, Laz. That was great. We appreciate it. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Foncier? I guess there's none, huh? I guess I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, oh. for, the, 
um, what do you, um, you know, from your experience, what do you think the role of the JAK Jack stack inhibitors will be? Um, and um, do you think they'll be, if um, they were available as an oral pill, that that would um, increase the use in the United States as opposed to the biologics that are injectable? I think, uh, so the, uh, that's a great question, Paul, because I think the fact that it is, a very, yeah, the studies are on the pill. I, I, the, the, I think the, the topical is, I think, only in phase two. Uh, but, but the pills, there are phase three already. So the advantages that I see uh, with the JAX is one is the onset of action is pretty, it's quicker than uh, the biologics, that's one. Second is uh, its role could be, the potential for side effects is much higher. Okay, at least compared to the Pilima, the only one in the market. So you will anticipate a higher uh, um, uh, side effects. Uh, so safety will still become an issue. But um, I think you have a group of patients where your dupilumab will fail. That's one. You have your group of patients where really they're very severe. And there is a potential for more flexibility with the JAX. In other words, um, you know, you take a pill once a day or twice a day. Uh, will you be able to stop and start once your, your atopic dermatitis is controlled? Can you stop it and then restart? Uh, the, the chances of a resensitization of, of, of uh, antibody production uh, as you would have stopping and starting a biologic where you develop neutralize, neutralizing antibodies. We don't see that in the JAKs. We don't see that in the oral JAKs. So, you know, stopping and starting or adjusting flexibility in dosing, reducing the dosing. I mean, those are, th those are uh, advan probably the advantages I see if the JAKs do come up in the market. But I think they will have some black box warning uh, because of the uh, as I said, potentially more side effects. But yes, I see a room for the JAKs in a certain population of patients. Yeah, I just think with uh, being able to take a pill, I think a lot of people would be would think that would be a lot easier and, um, to, for their lifestyles than, you know, doing injections or whatever. So Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, um, we're past the hour and we've kept you long enough. We appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to give us this great talk this morning. Um, I've heard you speak on um, eczema numerous times and every time you, uh, uh, the, I learned something new from your talks and so I appreciate Thank that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Paul, our, it's, it's easy for our um, fellows to access the tape, the tape uh, lectures, right? I wanted yeah. them to access David's le uh, lecture. That was great. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Portnoy is getting the um, getting these turned around, and uh, the latest ones he's been he's been doing in in about a week or so. So, and then they'll okay. they'll get uploaded. Um, I think when I sent you the login, I think I also included. If I didn't, let me know. But the the um, the uh, YouTube page um, where you can access the library. Your fellow is probably. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Your family will probably know it already. Thank okay, thank yeah. you. Have, have a Thanks. great week. Bye. Bye, everyone. We'll see you on Monday.